He's the Lisan Al Gaib. Welcome to Primary Technology, the podcast about the tech news that matters. This week, even bigger changes to the App Store and Apple in the EU, the whole Epic Games versus Apple debacle. We're going to get into that. TikTok might be close to getting banned or have to be sold here in the U.S. Some AI news, especially a weirdly photoshopped photo of the royal family, and we'll have a grab bag of topics at the end. This episode is brought to you by you, the members who support us directly. I'm one of your hosts, Stephen Robles, and joining me as always is my friend Jason Aiton. How's it going, Jason? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm sorry. I did the Lisa on Al Gaib thing because I just been loving the memes, and mm. I just can't do it. And I see a lot of those memes on TikTok, ironically, which we should talk about later. The only ones <laughs> I see, ironically, are the ones that you post. <laughs> I can tell how much you love them. <laughs> which is a, do, it's a Dune 2 reference, right? Just in case anyone here has no yes. idea what you're talking about. Okay. It's a Dune 2 reference. At least that Al-Gay was in the first one, but the do, the memes are really coming from Dune 2. And uh, yeah, we, we're going to have to talk about TikTok in a little bit because cause you are a staunch, staunchly against the use of TikTok, it seems like. But I'm not. I mean, I'm, I don't know if staunchly, but I don't use it and I don't let my kids use it. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you just ban it from the house. Yeah, yeah. Not that you're they, they against may, it. They may ban it from the U.S. It's already been banned from our house, so it doesn't matter to me at <laughs> okay, all. Okay, okay. Well, we're going to get into that because it's interesting there. We have some five-star review shout-outs. Real quick before we do that, I want to thank you all. We did pass the 500 subscribers on YouTube, so thank you all for doing that. If you haven't yet, go ahead and subscribe to that YouTube channel. We have a great video version over there. I share short-form clips during the week. And we were back into the top 50 tech shows in Apple Podcasts last week, so thank you guys for that. And so now, you know, kind of asking everyone, you did five-star reviews, you subscribe to the YouTube channel, and so now we ask you just spread the word. Tell everybody Primary Technology is the tech podcast they should be listening to if they enjoy that kind of content. And four five-star reviews this week. Forgive me if I mispronounce this name. It's uh, <laughs> I don't know how to say it. <laughs> it's just a bunch of random letters. Thank you for your five-star review. Sean Hudgens, Battery Percentage On. People are still leaving that in the reviews. That's fine. Yeah. You can keep doing that. Nicholas Bridal, he wrote a significant review. His very kind words. Thank you. Battery percentage on Apple Maps user, of course. But our final five star review this episode was on my team. CPL Forrest Gump. He's also from Florida. Maybe it's a Florida thing. <laughs> Battery percentage off. I think the uh, first one. The first I think, one. <laughs> I think you might be right. And you're very excited about it. And yeah. we're going to get to the brave thing later. But this feels like the same thing where you finally found one and you're celebrating <laughs> it as if it's a 100% increase or something. So It's yeah. called confirmation bias. That's what it's called. <laughs> it's called resetting bias. the, uh, uh, the x-axis. <laughs> exactly. Oh, man. Brave. I feel bad. Yeah. No, I don't feel bad for them. They should yeah. post the graph. Anyway, we're going to talk about that, too. All right. We have to talk about the App Store and the EU Epic Games escapades. I was going for a little alliteration there. <laughs> so right after we recorded last week's episode, we were talking about how Apple rejected Epic Games' Sweden developer account, which looked like they weren't going to be able to do a third-party app marketplace in the EU. I think that afternoon, like Thursday afternoon or maybe Friday, Apple reinstated the Epic Games account and are going to allow Epic Games to do third-party app marketplaces because they now have a Swedish developer account that's active. But Apple also announced even more changes coming to the App Store in the EU. Seems very fluid. It just seems like this continues to evolve in Apple's policies coming forward. And so this was the actual developer newsroom release. This actually came out uh, earlier this week on Tuesday telling you about the more flexibility that app marketplaces and third-party developers are going to be able to have. And so we know about the alternative app marketplaces linking out to purchase. Again, this is all EU only. Just keep that in mind. But the biggest change from this newsroom article is that web distribution is going to be possible, meaning if you are a developer in the EU, you will be able to release your apps or allow users to download your third-party app directly from a link on a website without even having to be in a third-party app marketplace or a uh, like the Apple's App Store. And so you can just have that direct download link, which is pretty wild. This is, I think, the side-loading that most people think of when they think side-loading. Like, let me just go to a website, download an app, and install it on my phone. And in the EU, it seems like this would be possible. Now, there are some big caveats. I don't know if you saw these. <laughs> there are some yeah. big things that... So if you are a developer in the EU and you want to offer this, this direct download link from Safari to be able to download an app, you have to have, have had an app 
that had more than 1 million first annual installs on iOS in the EU in the prior year. Yep. So you have to have an app. There's over a million downloads in the prior year. I think that's that's weeding out a lot of smaller developers or new developers that you know might want to try and do this. You actually have to have basically a record of an app that's downloaded a lot. Also, you have to uh, have a an account. I think in good standing for two years was the was the other thing. I'm trying to look here. You have to only offer apps from your developer account. Be responsive to communications from Apple regarding your apps distributed through web distribution, which seems like a very ominous bullet point. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, whatever that is. Uh, but here it is. Be a member of good standing in the Apple Developer Program for two continuous years or more. Jason, guess who has not had a developer account in good standing for two years or more is Epic Games. Yeah. Yeah, they that's true. Not. Well, so technically, it doesn't say the previous two years. It does just say two continuous years or more. So it is a, Apple mm. does a really good job of being very unclear when they try to expand and provide more information about things. <laughs> For example, I just was thinking about this, and I read the one million app, you know first installs as you had to have essentially had an app that added a million customers in the previous years, though... This looks mm. like the same language that they used when they were talking about the core technology fee, which really this is what that's about. It's about the the point is they only want people to be able to do side loading who are going to be paying them the 50 cents per <laughs> download, 50 cent euro, whatever we've decided that's called. So, right. but if that's true, then it isn't just, so hypothetically, that would mean it wouldn't just be 1 million new customers. It would be first installs, which Apple considers an update during that year. So if you had right. either a million downloads of your app or some combination of downloads of your app plus updates of your app during that year, then you would be eligible. But again, the point's the same. that This is going to mean that you're paying 50, 50, half a euro for every single one of these. But can I go back to the right. Epic thing for just a second? Because there yeah, was please. this really fascinating Twitter thread between John Gruber and Tim Sweeney. I don't know if you saw this. Oh, but huh. based on that thread, I'll uh, drop a link to it real quickly here if I can figure out where I put it in my... Uh, um, <laughs> My browser, because I have 173,000 tabs open right now. But, um, tab groups. Got yeah, tab, oh, groups tab groups would not help me right now. But, um, <laughs> but in that conversation, it was pretty clear that the application that Epic put through was just automatically approved. This was not like something that they negotiated with Apple, because there was some speculation. It's like right. Apple knew that this had happened. So why did they then, you know, can their, uh, can their account after the fact? And so right. they... It turns out that Apple, this was just an automated thing. It happened mm. in about, it took about three days for it to be approved. And it was like one day Phil Schiller woke up and was like, wait a minute. I see a list of new app developer <laughs> things and epics on there. Who, how did this happen? I, I got to email somebody. And so I feel like the whole thing was just like a very strange confluence of events. I'm just dropping this link for you in our, in our little iMessage. But it actually okay. started with a, a, a chat from, or a, post from Ryan Jones, who is the developer of Flighty, that Tim Sweeney responded to, that then John Gruber responded to, and Gruber and Sweeney went back and forth for a while, talking kind of about the whole thing. It was actually fascinating just to kind of, you know, Tim Sweeney says, we applied for Epic Games Sweden account under Apple's normal process, and Apple approved it in the normal way. We don't know what their process is to go through to approve accounts, but like they didn't call up, you know, Tim Cook and be like, hey, dude, we're thinking of doing this. Is that is that possible? Right. And, you right. know, it was just, we just, they just fill out the form, Set, hit, submit and three days later they had a developer account and then someone at Apple realized uh oh so then Apple kicked them out again and then <laughs> as you and I predicted I just want to make sure that we're on record yes, getting our yes. points here as we predicted the the EU made them do it anyway right because the response right. from Epic was basically after a swift inquiry from the European Commission Apple has decided to reinstate our developer account so it's like somebody at the European Commission called up Tim Cook and was like what are you doing? And the stakes are very high for Apple. I didn't realize right. this, but the penalty for not complying with the DMA is, I think I've heard both 10 or 20% of your global revenue. So for a company like Apple, where their global revenue is like $400 billion, can you imagine if they got a fine of somewhere between 40 billion and 80 billion dollars like they're not going to mess around with that like that's wow. apple makes a lot of money but they're, they're not like that is more money than they make selling macs and ipads like 
You know what right. I mean? Not, not combined, they'd but you get what I'm their saying. their entire Mac yeah. business it's in like, a single I mean, fine. Yeah, they'd have to call Google and be like, I'm, we're going to need you to up that search deal just to cover our fines in the EU. <laughs> Which we have altered the deal. Yeah. I needed to use that Darth Vader yeah. quote just every we week we're talking the deal. about this. So, so anyway, I just wanted to clarify what had exactly happened because there was some That's question good. about why would Apple give them the account and then take it back because of the tweets. I still think it was pretty thin-skinned that Apple took it back because of the tweets, but yeah. it's almost worse that Apple really had no idea that they had given them the account in the first place. <laughs> Which is strange because I have always thought that Apple – promoted that their app store review was a human process and i feel like i remember images from years ago of like the app review like station i feel like it was a do you remember this it was like a picture of a desk yeah. and it had like like a mac an ipad an iphone and if there was like a human review and that was years ago so maybe it has changed but i always thought it was human review and that that's why it took long and so is this new that it's well, automated? Well, hold on. There's a difference between app store review and creating oh, a developer true, true. account, right? I have a that's developer true. account. I promise you no one looked at my application because I've never made an app. The <laughs> only reason I have a developer account is because that used to be the only way you could get the betas. To get the betas. Right? Yeah, you don't need one now. Same. And yet same. I still have a $99 a year developer account for who knows what reason. Which, I feel like you it's don't need to pay the, that. Right. You don't need to correct. pay that for the betas anymore. Yeah, right. Changed. I could stop paying but, for it, but whatever. My, the point being that you, the process of creating a developer account seems to be automated. But yes, App Store Review actually right. submitting the apps is not an automated thing. So right. All right. So now you had an article, and I, I would like you to share the one thing. Apple doesn't. Apple <laughs> Apple's plan to allow side loading on the iPhone doesn't address the one thing anyone cares about. What is the one thing? Anyone yeah, the cares one thing about? is the money. Like that's oh. the only thing developers <laughs> care about. Like here, this is why yeah. I, I wrote this this morning because Apple's going to allow side loading. Developers are still going to be really, really angry because they're still going to collect the 50 cent Euro per, per download and, you know, installation. The, right. like, I think we should just be clear about this, that the only thing either of these groups developers, and I'm not throwing shade at developers. I understand why they care about the money. They care about the money right. because they don't feel like they're getting value out of the relationship from Apple which is fair, right. like they don't feel like they're being treated well. So paying 30 cents of the money that they, or 30% of the money they bring in feels like a ripoff. If you get rejected from the app store, if you're a small developer, you get rejected because of some random, like remember the call sheet. You know, we've, we've talked a lot about call right. sheet. We both love that app. I wrote a review yeah. of the app. You know, I've talked with Casey Liss about it and he kept getting rejected for random things. It's like you have photos of, or you know, have images of movies in here. It's like, yeah, yes, it's a movie app. Like it's going to have photos of, <laughs> it's gonna have oh, movie I'm sorry, posters. that's a copyright, you know, restriction. So right. I feel like if that was, if it was a more seamless process, developers might feel better about it. But the truth is they want third party app stores because they wanted to not pay Apple anything. Well, Apple's like, well, we're going to make you pay anyway. They wanted side loading because they wanted to not, if Apple would, just, and what I said in this article is if Apple would just lower the commission to say, oh, I don't know, 10% on everything except for games, developers would all use the app store happily because of the benefits that they do get from it. They just wouldn't right. feel like they're being extorted and having their business held hostage. And then the flip side of that is Apple's focus on the money, right? That's the thing that the Apple seems sure. to care the most about is actually making the experience worse for users. The fact that you can't sign up for Spotify in the app is ridiculous. And the fact that Spotify can't really tell you why you can't right. sign up or where to sign up is a terrible experience for users. And it is, I think, a tragedy that Apple is so focused on collecting pennies that it is mm. missing that bigger point. So that was the, that was my article. Yeah. The gist. All right. You, you can tell well, I, I want to point out one of Sorry. You got feel like <laughs> I do want to point out this one other interesting thing. This again, John Gruber was talking about an app found in the app store called Deal Machine. And this was interesting because it's available here in the U.S. It's a real estate app. And apparently this app is getting away with directly linking to an external website to start a subscription, which is flagrantly against the current app store rules here in the U.S. But somehow... I don't know if this app is still live. <laughs> I wonder if <laughs> Apple like <laughs> ejected it out of the store as soon as Gruber posted this article. Uh. But when as soon as you download this app called Deal Machine, you basically see a splash screen asking you to choose a tier and there's uh you know a free trial and then you have to go into a tier which is either $100 a month all the way up to $500 a month. And when you choose your tier in this Deal Machine app, it sends you out to Safari to make a payment via Stripe, totally bypassing Apple's in-app payment system. And again, this is just wrong. Like this is against Apple's App Store guidelines here in the US. 
And there's some horror stories of people unable to cancel their subscription because this is not a built-in Apple subscription. It's not on that subscriptions page in the settings of your iPhone. They are trying to like contact the company directly, and it's a bit of a mess for some of these users. And that's a hefty subscription. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> five hundred to a thousand dollars a month, or I think some of them are a year, and I just think this doesn't feel great. Again, in light of all that's going on in the EU, and it seems like there's some arbitrary rule changing sometimes, and Apple just kind of you know moving goalposts at times, and this again is like, and then apps like this, like just kind of skirt and somehow go under the radar and make it into the App Store. I don't know how an app with a splash screen and a five hundred dollars subscription per month as soon as you open the app, would get past app review. Right. Apparently it did. It's funny because there's this phrase on the internet called getting fireballed, which is not obscene. <laughs> it's just that if you sometimes if you get linked to from John Gruber's blog, Daring Fireball, it can crash uh, your website because it sends so much traffic. Yes. Like This is a thing that would happen frequently to small websites when he would link to them. Right. And it's usually sort of a catch 22 pop up generally a positive thing because you just got all this traffic i feel like this is a totally different version of that because i can't imagine i mean we know for a fact that people like phil schiller and greg joswiak read daring fireball oh absolutely so this poor developer and they, i shouldn't say this poor developer because they're charging 500 dollars a month not for a subscription <laughs> they're just not poor but this is unfortunate for them that it came to this per- it's kind of like we were just hiding right over here no one was paying attention i promise you everyone is paying attention now everyone everyone sees it now uh, the yeah. app is probably not even there anymore so anyway um one other i just want to mention this uh, in light of all the eu stuff the other thing that happened in 17.4 was that default browser choice screen that comes up when you update in the eu and we talked about that and there's been you know whether that's a good experience for users or not but brave browser which is a Chromium browser. You can get it on your Mac. You can get the app on your iPhone. Well, they posted this graph on threads saying since 17.4 and that splash screen for choosing a default browser, that their uh, uptick in users, you know, has this very big line going up that once that happened, 17.4 released, all of a sudden it shot up and a bunch of new users are now using Brave because they're arguing that users now have a choice and are at least surfaced the option. And when people are given the option, they might choose a third-party app. Now, okay, that's their argument. One of the issues was this graph, which the, the y-axis always seems to get people, and Apple included. Yeah. Sometimes when they're talking about those M-chips, those y-axes are very strangely uh, you know, calculated. But this graph basically shows that, on average, they had like 7,000 to 8,000 installs on iPhone. And then once 17.4 happened, it jumped up to 11,000, which is 3,000 more downloads in the or installs in the EU. And there's probably over 100 million iPhone users in the EU. So that's context. Like... 3,000 users, you know, for a third-party app, that might be great. Brave is a pretty big browser, I think, so I don't know if this is a huge difference. Uh, but also, in light of the all the users in the EU, iPhone users, this is probably not, a, this is a minuscule percentage of people who have installed Brave. And also, like, don't mess with your Y-axis to make it look like <laughs> it's a huge jump. Like, yeah. maybe start at zero, maybe... I don't know. What what should they have done differently with this graph so they didn't get well, all this blowback? Okay, so in fairness, so first of all, I want to say I've interviewed Brendan Ike, the CEO of Brave, on stage at Web Summit before, we've, and he is certainly not a fan of the way the internet exists today, which is essentially a duopoly <laughs> between Apple and Google. So I want to mm. just, there is a little bit of feelings involved there. So, okay. uh, although his, I generally speaking, I would have said his, bigger beef is with google which is why you would you wouldn't build another chromium browser if you didn't have a beef with google but (laughs) in fairness to them this is literally the exact kind of graph that apple uses at every presentation it does about everything right they are just taking a cue from the masters of graphs that mean nothing right so at least they put numbers on the side which is because apple has put up graphs that don't even have numbers and you're just like this is our computer compared to something we don't know like we don't like no one has a clue what it is that they're talking about so i do just want to give them credit for that but this backfired it immediately because people were pointing out that you put out a graph that made it look like your installs had quadrupled and really 
they maybe went up by 50% and you went from 8,000 to 11. Now, is that per day or is that total people using it in the EU? I don't know. Like, it's hard to say what that means. So what they should have probably done differently is waited over a course of like three months and said, here's how this has made a change. Because the, the, I I don't remember who it was. I saw that posted this, uh, but one take was like, well, one take was like, but we're just confused. (laughs) <laughs> right like there's an i mean the <laughs> browser ballot is terrible it doesn't mean that people may yeah there you go there's one of our apple graphs that have this is one of apple's yeah this was during the scary fast event where apple released the m3 lineup <laughs> and it's like what does it even mean the, the y-axis yeah the y-axis just is labeled relative performance <laughs> so i feel like if you if you label an axis relative by default it's already nebulous yeah. is like <laughs> you can just draw this, lines anywhere mean? you want put numbers and be like this is just you know relative it's all relative and then zero like if it was a performance axis i would think maybe zero to a hundred percent like when it's peak performance but the y-axis is zero to 150 like zero to 150 what? yeah <laughs> I don't, get what, it, I don't know what that it's means. It's like units of something, but we don't know yeah. what they are. So, and in fairness to Apple, again, yeah. these are what are called Bezos graphs because Jeff Bezos is the person who originally started putting out graphs like uh, this that mean absolutely nothing where they're not properly labeled. <laughs> but I think I think Brave may have a point. It's just that they didn't do a very good job of articulating that point because it's kind of like this is actually the exact same thing we're going to talk about with the Kate Middleton photo. It's like you just lost your credibility right. because of this thing that you did that made us not be able to trust you. But... I, right. we, we, it will be very interesting to see the effect on Safari users in the EU based on users having to be given a choice, right, to, in what browser they want to install. Right. The thing is, right. you can already download Brave. You can already down The whole list of browsers are already available in the App Store. None of them are new, right? Chrome is an option, and yet people right. still use Safari. So right. I don't know that it's going to make a huge difference. Good for Brave if they picked up some extra users, but I, was it Gruber or was it somebody else who was like, maybe they were just maybe it was an accident. Maybe people were just confused because this browser <laughs> ballot is so ridiculous. People just tap things so they can get past it. Right. Well, and so they Brave posted this image of the splash screen, and in this image, Brave is at the top, but they said the list of browsers is randomized. Sure. So if you're in the EU and you update 17.4, it's not like Brave is the first choice all the time. I would be curious if Microsoft, like for Microsoft to release a graph, <laughs> hopefully one that makes sense, about is there an uptick in Edge downloads since 17.4 in the EU? Maybe because Microsoft is a more well-known brand. But to Brave's credit, probably way too late uh, for the backlash to be subsided, but they posted another graph with the Y-axis going from zero to 12,500 <laughs> And then it's new install volume. And like you do still see the uptick, you know, again, you can make this Y axis zero to a million and then it would just look like a flat line. So, you know, I'm not exactly sure what people want. Yes, there were more installs of Brave than on average after the 17.4 update. That's also not indicative of usage. Like there might've been a bunch of people who downloaded and installed Brave and was like, oh, wait a minute. I can't access my iCloud tabs right. <laughs> or something, or all my bookmarks aren't here. Never mind. I'll go back to Safari. So, like, this doesn't tell the whole story, right? Uh, but I well, and it is an it, the, ba- the ballot is really just to select your default browser. So, what this is essentially right. saying, though, is people were selecting Brave as their default browser, and then they went to download it. So, think about what that means. These are right. people who didn't already have Brave on their phone so like did they not even know it existed are they really choosing it as their default browser if they didn't like it has a nice icon i guess (laughs) i don't know like it seems to me as though like that is true it's just that's the percentage of people who got the browser ballot and brave was first and they just tapped through and like wait what did i just do because (laughs) if you tap one of those links it takes you to the app store to download that particular browser and i think then once you download it also changes the setting maybe or i don't know somebody in the eu can let us know what happens next but all i wanted to be clear is like if you were to go down and choose safari i think it would do nothing because it's already on your phone and it would just leave the default setting alone so this means these are people who chose it as their default browser and didn't even have it on their phone so i don't know what that tells you (laughs) that is that is true um so anyway let us know in the eu also by the way in case you were going to try and use a vpn to download like a third party app or whatever. One of the things that Apple is doing, I think we mentioned this on the past episode, but they are also using like geolocation to see if you are in the EU or not. 
and if you would like be allowed to install third party app marketplaces or now install apps via the web with the new web di distribution options. So if you think that like using a VPN here in the US to make it look like your IP address is coming from Europe will let you download Fortnite in a couple months or whatever, like it's not the case. Yeah. It's not just and that. I, I think if I so. remember correctly, I thought that there was like three things that they take into account your the, the location of your Apple ID, right? What country your Apple ID is associated with, your actual right. location and I don't even remember what the other ones, maybe whatever address you listed. So like, it's not like you can just tell oh, it, right. I'm in the EU. Let me just get all those, those different features. You have to like, it would be a lot right. of work for someone. You have to get a burner, you know, Apple ID somehow set up <laughs> oh, in the yeah. EU. It's like, it just doesn't feel like no. it's worth it. I know there are people who and turn the off opposite. every location. Yeah, service. exactly. I know there are people, well, maybe it won't even let you do it. If you have location services turned off, like, cause it, if it's oh, depending true. on that to tell it where you're at, you probably do have to have that on. So, it's probably not worth it, really. Like, side loading is not, not worth it. What? Why? As a user, why? Unless you're trying to download apps that are just not available. Okay, but like, other than that, yeah. it's just a technical curiosity, I guess, for some people. I mean, gaming is a huge deal. Like, if my kids could download Fortnite directly to their iPads or iPhones from a website, they would do it. Like, that would be enough for them. I think users, maybe like us, like, there's no app that I want that I can't get already in the app store, which I think when you're in kind of like the productivity world of Apple, it's like a calendar app, task apps, you know, there's a wealth of third party apps you can get directly from the app store from third party developers. Like, but I think maybe games is probably one of the big use cases. So well, anyway, we'll see. Just buy your kids but a I PlayStation. To, I mentioned, just get your kids a PS4. They can not, play Fortnite just fine. It's cheaper than all of this. But Jason, it's, it's not portable. <laughs> The PlayStation is not portable. <laughs> and like my kids will try to do cloud gaming. And I think PlayStation has this one where you can like play your console, yep. but it's basically like streaming the video to your device. And even in the same house on my ridiculous two gig speed internet and my <laughs> Wi Fi that's really good, <laughs> it's not a good experience. Like it's like playing it is not great. So that's why I say maybe, maybe games is the option. But I want, but I mentioned VPN. Because a lot of youths here in the <laughs> U.S. might be very get they might get very familiar with VPNs because TikTok might get banned, and so this has been going around in the U.S. government. And the House of Representatives passed a bill to force TikTok, either for the Chinese owner, which is ByteDance, to either sell TikTok to, I guess, a U.S. company, or ban the app. So the House of Representatives passed this bill, and now it's going to the Senate. And the, if the Senate decides to do this, it is possible that TikTok either has to be sold, and then it's on ByteDance in China, whether or not they're actually going to sell it. It would be probably a huge loss of revenue uh, ongoing for them, or uh, the app might get banned. Now, this would be a situation where I think a lot of people would get very familiar with VPNs very quickly. Because I imagine if it was banned, quote unquote, here in the U.S., switching over to like millions of people already have the app on their phone, using a VPN will probably allow you to use this. But I will say, because I, I do use TikTok and we'll talk about this, <laughs> we'll get into why or why not in a minute. But one day uh, earlier this week, if you open the TikTok app, there was a splash screen from TikTok of like, call your congressman, which... Right. Anyone who uses TikTok probably like the Venn diagram of people who use TikTok and call people on the phone. Like the, the circles don't even touch. You know, yeah. it's, it's it's not even a Venn diagram. And, it's and just then two add big circles. people who know what a con who knew their congressperson is, and that circle's just way off in the corner. Right. Like there's no overlap exactly. between those things. Yeah. So I, I think that was probably. I mean, I get. It. I mean, it was desperate, but I don't think it's going to happen. I was trying to find. A, uh, a screenshot of this. Here's a, this is from uh, Mashable. This is what the screen. Oh, it was in my article. Looked like I put it in my article too. Oh, was it in your yeah, article? Okay. Well, let me just share your article, right. Jason. I'll well, while you're share... doing that, no, I didn't know. While you're doing that, let me. Yeah. I want to back up just so people may remember that the Trump administration tried to ban TikTok. Right? They tried to force them to yes. sell to Microsoft, and the basic reason for that was because teenagers were using TikTok to organize basically a protest. Or no, they were organizing this thing where Trump was having a rally and, and TikTokers were reserving all the spots for it and then not didn't show up. And mm. so like no one was at this this event. And so Trump got really, really, right. really mad at TikTok. 
So he was going to ban it. <laughs> he was going to make Microsoft buy it. Satya Nadella, there was an interview he did where he talked about that experience. And he's like, it was it basically, he's like, it was just the most bizarre couple weeks of my life. Like, flat out, this, I don't even know what was happening. Yes, we tried to buy TikTok. And then all of a sudden, poof, it was gone. And so that happened. And then after, wow. after a while, people got distracted by things like, you know, the election and whatever else was going on after that. And sure. people lost interest in worrying about it. And then at some point in the very recent future, well, last year, I think it was Montana passed a law to ban TikTok and a federal judge said, you can't do that. Right. That is still under appeal. Right. Then at some point, it, the Congress people, members of Congress, members of the Senate have received like briefings. Like, this is a little bit unclear, but the reporting is that sometime in the very recent future, they received a briefing about the national security threat that is TikTok. And then all of a sudden, it was like, we have to do something. And so there is actually a subcommittee wow. on China-ish in the House, and they had a hearing on this. This bill kind of came out of nowhere. It's it's a bipartisan bill. I can't pronounce the Democratic senator. I apologize. His, his name is actually in this article, um, but I'm not looking at it, so I'm not even going to try to. If you yeah, no, no, go down just not. a little bit, uh, right there. Oh, you passed it, but that's okay. Congressman, I'm not gonna. Raja. Yeah, there. Thank you. So, Congressman Raja. and Mike Gallagher, who's a Republican, they they put this bill forward, which would essentially f re make it illegal for Google and Apple to host TikTok in the app stores if it was controlled by a foreign national, or it would be illegal for other services on the internet to sort of serve it up. So, this was like wasn't really clear whether this was going to pass or not and then TikTok did what you just described they put up this scare sheet you could not get past it there was the only options you have were right. force quit the app or tap that link that says call and when you called you put in your right. zip code which by the way TikTok does not use precise location tracking they just use general location tracking you just gave them right. your zip code they now know exactly where you're <laughs> located if you did this and they and apparently thousands know. of people called their Congress people, many of them having no idea what they were calling to talk about. It was just, please don't ban my TikTok, right? I just, I saw this thing. You want to get rid of TikTok. That would be bad. And the question is, are you old enough to vote? And the people are like, no, I'm 13. Well, you shouldn't have a TikTok account and I don't care. And then they passed it 50 to nothing, <laughs> right? It had the exact opposite wow. effect that TikTok, like they, they vastly overestimated their pull <laughs> from doing this. And they've- wow. They've seen other like Uber has done this notoriously, right? They would go into a city, they would recruit a bunch right. of drivers, start recruiting a bunch of uh, riders, and then they would be like, "Lobby your your local city council to make sure that they don't block right. us or whatever." So this now we're at the point where this week the House of Representatives actually passed this bill. They actually like it is now going to the Senate, and it was passed by right. a pretty large majority it was like 265 or no three feet 352 to 65 oh. this was not a small yeah. like thing it's now going to the senate and president biden has already said that if the senate passes this bill he'll sign it which would force within 180 wow. days for bite dance to either divest of tiktok or for them to be removed from the app stores so it, it's not exactly a ban but there are a lot there's 170 i think million us users of tiktok so this has a real impact on people yeah. but also yeah. the the rea the 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 objection to this from a lot of people is like well this is a first amendment issue right like you can't block tiktok that's where people have the right to speak on whatever platform that they want it's not really like what the first amendment says it doesn't say you have the right to say anything you want <laughs> anywhere you want like the us can say you can't right. you can't have tiktok you can just post your stuff on reels like it's it's really not a First Amendment right. issue. It's just a, we think this app is bad. We don't want it in our country. So, yeah, there you go. TikTok is fascinating to me for a couple of reasons. One, when that Montana law was going through uh, whatever it was doing, Hank Green, who is a really big YouTuber, um, and he's a huge TikTok following. He's very active on TikTok. He was like, "That's I've built this huge following. And... I guess what's fascinating to me is TikTok has allowed a a bunch of new kinds of creators to reach a level of prominence so quickly. An example would be Keith Lee, the food reviewer. I think he was also an MMA fighter, so he might have had an audience previously. But there are a bunch of people that you would have never heard of before. There's a guy that I follow who talks about like World War One and Two history in like really funny and creative ways. 
And he just like posted a TikTok that he got a brand deal through it. He now has a million followers. Literally, like not to be disparaging, like he was no one. Like he like no one knew who he was. And the fact that it has allowed that to like happen to these kinds of creators, I think is cool. Like it brings people who have the creative capability and knowledge and ability to explain things. Like there's a bunch of like really great creative people on there which can't really translate that audience to another platform. Like so many TikTokers because the money situation is so bad on TikTok. Like if you try to be a creator, even with millions of followers, you will make maybe a few hundred dollars, thousand dollars a month, even with millions and millions of views. And it's only here in the US. Canada doesn't have a creator fund. There's no monetization in Canada. And I'm not sure how it is in other countries outside the US. So like, even though it's not a great a platform for creators to make money. It has been a platform to create audiences. And without TikTok, I don't know if these people would have been able to create a platform on YouTube or whatever. And this was indicative. And the flip side of that, I've been listening to a lot of Neelai Patel decoder episodes about <laughs> algorithmic platforms <laughs> yeah. and the downfall of society or whatever. And to that point, the reason why I have TikTok is it was during the pandemic. It was literally four years ago, like yesterday, uh, because I, re I still remember it was on my birthday, March 13th, 2020. Wait, your birthday was yesterday? My birthday was have yesterday. We, hold on. We have to stop for a second. <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah. I didn't know this. You, this is the kind of That's thing fine. your That's podcast fine. partner should know. Well, well, I, you know, I feel weird about, you know, I thought all day about posting like, hey, it's my birthday. And I was like, what, am, what, what is that? What am I going to, what am I asking people? To, to I don't know, do? but feel, listeners, you know, listen, weird. if you have not left a five-star review <laughs> yet, please make that your birthday present to Steven. Sure, leave him, sure. and if you're watching this on YouTube, leave him a comment and subscribe. But I just want your review to say happy birthday, Steven, please. It'll be super confusing for people later, but I, this is important. I'm sorry. Go back to TikTok now, but your birthday four years ago. Keep going. Yes. Also, go ahead and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Yeah. You do one thing. If everyone that's listening right now subscribes to our YouTube channel, we will have thousands of subscribers. That would be amazing. So that will give you a little Happy hint. birthday, Stephen. Yeah, could do that. Thank that would be amazing. Thank you very Hit much. TikTok. So four years ago on my birthday is when the world shut down. Uh, <laughs> okay, that was Florida, not a good that's... <laughs> Let's make this birthday better, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. But, but that was four years ago. And so the world shut down. Everybody was home. And it was in that moment where I was like, well, I'm home. Let me try. That's when I created my personal YouTube channel. It was in 2020 and I created a TikTok account. And the first TikTok video I ever posted was ironically a shortcut. OK, which is how I've been making, <laughs> I don't know, audience everywhere. Shortcuts. Thank you, Matthew Casanelli. Yeah. If you're listening, you've inspired me. Uh, and it was a shortcut about how to like automate changing your wallpaper every day using an unsplash API. Like it was the most nerdiest thing ever that first TikTok I ever posted, literally in the first 36 to 48 hours, got 700,000 views, the most views I'd ever gotten on a piece of content I had ever made, and 10,000 followers mm. on TikTok, literally in days. And in that moment, I was like, this is amazing. Uh, maybe this is a platform to make a go at content creation. And so I did. But just to give you some perspective... Four years later, I now have, I think, 21,000 followers, mm. which is not commensurate <laughs> with that day one growth. You know, it's like that brave browser yeah, That growth. trend line did not you know, continue. Can, I, <laughs> the trend line did not continue, nor, like, I remember I'd, for a while I would post TikTok videos, like clips of my long-form YouTube, and I would say, go watch the full thing on YouTube. And I would literally get comments on TikTok of people being like, we're not going to your YouTube, bro. And I was like, huh. Right. If you're going to create content on a platform, you have to basically create it for that platform and for the audience on that platform and not expect them to follow you elsewhere. If people really, really love your content, like they'll find your YouTube channel and subscribe. But you can't just keep call to actioning them every video like it's it just doesn't work. So I realized maybe it's not a great platform, at least for my kind of content. Again, other content creators, maybe they have succeeded. So I find TikTok to be fascinating because that has been my personal experience and I see funny Dune memes, mm. and I save those memes, and I show them to my kids, <laughs> and I have not seen those memes elsewhere. 
and I could just use Instagram reels or whatever, but it takes months for trends to get to Instagram reels. Like it's just accurate. Like you'll see Dune two memes in a couple months yeah. on Instagram yeah. reels. <laughs> like that, that joke is just reality yeah. and TikTok is just where everything happens at first. So that's why I like being on there. I, I still feel a little icky about privacy and security. Like it does feel like that. I, I don't know what that app's doing in the background, but also like, well, too late now. It's been on my phone for a number of years. But yeah, so that, I don't know. That's my feelings on TikTok. And that's why I, I actually don't know. I don't know if I would care if it gets banned because honestly, my audience didn't work on there. I don't like I'm not trying to build it on there anymore. But I don't know. It's helped a lot of people, helped a lot of creators get an audience, whether that's been beneficial or not. Well, so, so OK, so TikTok has an algorithm that is by far the most effective at serving if you want to yes. know a person just look at their for you page just it'd be terrifying yes, right it's it's, no one wants to show their for yeah. you page because it's probably like sure. i didn't want you to know that i like watching cow you know cute little baby cow videos <laughs> like i just was hoping no one would know that about me like seriously like i was wondering what you were going to pull there in the moment and i'm like okay that's pretty safe <laughs> I, that's pretty safe guns i, I don't know <laughs> there was there was there was one uh like congressional hearing where they yeah. were grilling the TikTok CEO yep. and the congressman was like, all I see on my for you page is blah, blah, blah. blah. And it was kind of embarrassing. And it, <laughs> yeah. and it was like, well, if you're seeing that on your for you page, yeah, you, that's you, what you want. You to probably say. shouldn't say it. Yeah. Cause t- you just shouldn't say that out loud. Like, clearly this congressperson yeah. didn't understand how effective that, yeah, algorithm is. And so that piece of it though, is, is one of the reasons why, TikTok, so it has all of the problems that every social media platform has, except for that it is in some ways extra engaging because of how effective right. that algorithm is. So it does bring people yeah. in, but none of that would be as big of a deal if it wasn't sort of under the thumb of the influence of, of the Chinese Communist Party, because some people talk right. about like the risk of them sharing information with on Americans with China, but like, let's be honest, Stephen, like it would be maybe embarrassing if someone saw all the videos that people were, cared about on TikTok, but China doesn't care. <laughs> they just don't care about, like they right. have other things to worry about, right? But the, one of the things that came out was the ratio of content after, after I think it was October 7th, that was either, that was pro-Israel versus pro-Palestine was like 95% right. pro-Palestine versus 5% pro-Israel. So regardless right. of what side of that issue you're on, it's pretty clear that there was a slant in the algorithm trying to push a very specific agenda. And that agenda benefits mm. China, not just benefits, you know, people who want to consume content. And this is why TikTok stunt backfired so much, because if your job is to make laws that you think will protect the privacy and security of Americans, and all of a sudden your phone starts ringing off the hook because teenagers were seeing a message on TikTok that told them to take action, you just it just proved your point, right? It literally just proved your point right. that this is an app that is serving the purposes, not just of the general public, but uh, it imposes a risk. Because imagine if the Chinese government decided that the thing that it should be showing was vote this way or don't vote this way or don't vote at all. Or, you know, you can vote right. by mail or you not vote by mail. You can vote on the internet or you can vote by cell phone. By t- These are all things that have appeared like in past, especially in the past election where people were getting text messages that said, don't go to your polling place, save time, just vote here on this link. Well, you, by the way, you can't vote on the internet people. You have to either show up in person <laughs> or vote by mail like absentee. Right. Like that's, that's it. That's the only way it's allowed in this country. And so that right. is the risk. So, so I think that if, I don't know that like we don't, our kids do not, well, let's be honest. My kids might have TikTok. They're not supposed to, but you know, they're kids. They do <laughs> things they're not supposed to. So I don't want to exhaustively say my kids don't have TikTok, but my kids are not supposed to have TikTok. I have two children sure. who are technically old enough to have TikTok accounts. I just don't think it's beneficial for them to have one more thing to scroll mm-hmm. through. They do have Instagram right. and it's funny. Um, the Verge uh, had the verge they recorded a live episode of the verge cast at south by southwest we'll talk about that i think in our bonus episode um but yes. in that particular episode they were they were drafting streaming services and somebody drafted tiktok in the free category and later on yeah. somebody tried to draft reels and they're like that's not a streaming service i'm like sure it is it's just tiktok two weeks later <laughs> like it is tiktok that's it but later right so our kids do have instagram and and if it was not owned by the china you know by bite dance so bite dance is not Chinese government, but it is has influenced right. by the Chinese government. If it wasn't, I still don't think we would let them have it because of all the other reasons, but it would make it less of an issue for most Americans. 
because you would at least feel like the content that is being served isn't there because someone has their finger on the algorithm trying to influence public opinion about issues that might benefit a right. foreign government. So that's my TikTok. Which rant. is also no, no, it's good. And it's part of the larger conversation, which maybe we can save it for another time. But the, I literally have been hearing Neil Patel talk a lot about algorithmic fees and he's been interviewing people on decoder. And it is interesting that, you know, once everything went algorithmic, I think, you know, Twitter used to be chronological only and then Twitter went algorithmic. And now everything, every social platform is algorithmic. Yes, you can go to your following feed on threads and you can try to go to your latest tweets on Twitter, but it's a several taps and a vast, vast majority of users just don't do it. And so if anyone's looking at social media, YouTube included, it's an algorithmic based content feed. And that means those algorithms not that it's sentient or that there's someone behind that we know of, like pulling the levers and dials, but it basically feeds in or creates the trend. And I think a, a fascinating example is the Stanley Cup phenomenon. <laughs> which, which you have to give a disclosure. To, <laughs> disclosure is, I talked about this on the Movies on the Side podcast. I think it was a bonus episode, but we have Stanley Cups. Anyway, it's a long story. <laughs> but... If you look into that, there's there's several like long YouTube videos that talk about the Stanley Cup phenomenon. And basically what it comes down to is the the marketing guy who used to work at Crocs actually and was able to make Crocs go viral, namely on TikTok through a variety of mechanisms, influencers, things like that. He left Crocs, went to Stanley, and now Stanley has had its moment where it's blown up on social media trend like you see stanley cups everywhere now i think it's interesting for two reasons one how that algorithmic feed look on your phone can translate into a physical product going viral in real life i see stanley cups everywhere which is wild but also like that was basically largely the direction of one person namely the marketing person at stanley who was at crocs who figured out enough of the bullet points or the steps to do to create that cultural thing on social media that translates to real life. And that is powerful and beneficial if you're a company wanting to sell a product, but can also be somewhat concerning when it's trying to, you know, promote or whatever ideas, you know, I think that, and that affects on a generation. And so one way or the other, I find it fascinating. I don't know if as a whole, like on the scale of Dungeons and Dragons, like morality chart is TikTok uh, chaotic evil. <laughs> is it <laughs> neutral evil? Is it? I, it's not good. No, like I'm not putting it in the good category. I don't know if it's neutral, but it's an algorithm. Yeah. And I don't know. I, I just find it to be fascinating. Okay, two so closing thoughts. We'll the first closing thought is yeah. I just want to when when Stephen says it's a long story. I don't know if you've watched Dune 2, but essentially that is the story of Steven's quest to get. I would recommend you just, I, I mean, I have no, no stake in the game. I'd recommend it's worth subscribing to, this, to the members edition of Movies on the Side just to hear that story. I, I'm, I'm, you can tell I'm a big fan of that movie. I mean, I've been on at least one episode, so you should go listen to that one too. Yeah. But yeah. That, it is worth it. But then my second actual real point was, I think the best example, I'm kind of surprised you didn't mention this, of the effect of TikTok is Widget Smith, right? Widget Smith was an app yes. that when Apple introduced, was it iOS 14 that had widgets for the first time ish? 15. So when when they when they first came out, no, iOS 14. I guess I should look at my own article that I have up right here. But I interviewed David <laughs> Smith shortly after that, and I mean, it was his app. Widget Smith was downloaded at the time over 50 million times, and it was entirely yeah. driven by teenagers on TikTok just showing off their, you know, aesthetic just, you know, home screens that they were able to create. The funny thing is almost none of them are using yeah. widgets, right? Like they're all just using I <laughs> they're using widgets with to create icons that they can they're basically like shortcuts right. or whatever. But anyway, so that is yeah. in my mind the best example. That's great. Wonderful for for David Smith and Widget Smith. Like that's amazing. Yeah. That's by far his most successful app, probably that he'll ever make, and it's entirely due to to TikTok. But imagine if the thing that went viral was something else. Like that's all you have to ask yourself. Right. Imagine if that kind of ability to drive that, which in this case was great, 
what if it was in you know in the case of the the war in Gaza or or like uh, this next right. election like we have high stakes happening the all the time is, yeah. and imagine if 50 million people instead of downloading an app were like oh I've been influenced by this and it's going to change the course of an election or something so yeah well you know I always think we're going to we're going to get halfway through we're going to get to 30 minutes oh, man. and then we're going to have other stuff after 30 minutes <laughs> It's been, we're at 50 minutes. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Well, the late, okay, the last TikTok <laughs> thing, because uh, just to wrap this up then is- no, it's good. Is, there is a, this morning on CNBC, former Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin, who most people have no idea who he is, but doesn't matter. He was a like film financer and an investor, and then he became the Treasury Secretary. He has said he's forming a group hmm. to buy TikTok if this law passes. So right. the right, good right, news right. there is we'll that you may not lose your TikTok. It may stick around. And I, listen, I, I'll be admit, like, I am conflicted also. Like, would it be good if it was gone? I don't know. <laughs> Honestly, I would trade today TikTok for Vine. <laughs> Give me back Vine. Wow, that's and a I'll, deep I cut. Will make that, <laughs> most... I will make that trade today. But honestly, like, that's another funny, uh, just, I don't know. On TikTok, sometimes you will see comments, a lot of comments sometimes, like, this would have killed on Vine. <laughs> Like people, <laughs> there's still nostalgia for that platform, and I just I do feel like Vine was just ahead of its time, because like TikTok, early TikTok was basically what Vine was doing, like short videos that looped, like yeah. that's it, and that's what Vine was. It was just a little too soon, maybe, or like creators weren't ready for it. I don't know. And you still see a lot of Vine stars on TikTok, and they're very like you know very. I think King Batch is one of them, and you see a lot of the other ones. But the anyway, two problems. The two problems. I find it fast. The two problems Vine have was one. I think the videos were limited to six seconds, which is six, seconds. which is maybe they picked the wrong number. And then two, they got bought by Twitter. Which is not necessarily known for its exceptional product capabilities. This is before it became X. I'm just saying, in general, right, Twitter right. was never known for having... And, like, Twitter was notoriously fragile, and so they probably couldn't host yeah. videos longer than six seconds looping because, like, <laughs> they true. are not YouTube, and they are not TikTok or even yeah. Facebook. So, yeah, I can't believe... Tw Twitter had a history of, like, kind of fumbling acquisitions and new features like periscope yeah all of them was a live Everything. streaming <laughs> they fumble all, it all every, <laughs> just anything they buy Vine, periscope yeah, yeah everything but anyway we all right we're actually going to try and do a lightning okay. round because we do, I do, do have some things that i want to mention before we do want to thank that this episode is brought to you by our members that support us directly in apple podcasts or via memberful and you can do that today you get bonus episodes every week you get an ad-free version, meaning this section will be cut out, and we just go right to the next chapter. And you can do that directly in Apple Podcasts. We make it easy there. $5 a month, $50 a year, and you get the bonus episodes and ad-free versions. I will say there are no chapters for the audio in Apple Podcasts. Not on me. Apple strips my chapters out for subscriber audio. I don't know why. So if you love chapters as much as I do, because I really love putting chapters and custom chapter artwork, what you can do is go to primarytech.fm, Click the bonus episodes link and you can support us via memberful. And that feed you get when you support us that way, it can be the only feed. You know, it can you get all the episodes, the full episodes and the bonus episodes together in that feed. I post everything in both places. And that means you can support the show, get ad free versions and the bonus episodes there as well. And if you can't do that, we understand. That's why a five star rating and a subscribe on YouTube means a lot. So thank you to everyone who supports us directly, although they didn't hear this because they got the ad-free version. <laughs> but thank you to but those thank of you, you who will support the show uh, because of this. So we thank you very much. Wonderful. <laughs> All right. Lightning round, lightning round. Here we go. Uh, I just want to mention, because I've been watching The Crown a lot on Netflix, <laughs> that this image of Kate Middleton that was posted, apparently she's the future queen of England. And she posted this picture. She had surgery maybe a couple months ago unclear what exactly the surgery was royal family has been kind of cagey on it and she has been out of the public uh, eye for quite a while since then and there's been questions like is she okay what's going on royal family has been kind of mum pun intended on that and so <laughs> sorry, I didn't do it literally Kate Middleton posted this photo it was Mother's Day in the UK earlier this week on, on March 11th and so it posted this photo and like uh, you just look at it. You just glance by like, okay, cool. Like posted a photo. She looks like she's doing well. Good to go. Well, as people do on the internet, they dove into this photo in depth, saw a lot of weird 
apparitions or whatever like the sleeve on the sweater this is like poor healing brush technique in photoshop like where's the cuff of the sweater over here like something funky happened here and also like are kate middleton's arms really this long like this seems kind of like an <laughs> odd thing maybe those hands were detached who knows and there's also like hair weird hair stuff going on again like poor healing brush uh technique <laughs> in photoshop you know hand is a little odd so just just some weird things in this photo and it was getting a lot of backlash because it, it seemed like you know if you're already not saying a lot about what happened and then you release a photo that seems heavily doctored then it looks even more suspicious yeah. and the royal family came out after all the backlash and they were like kate middleton said yes i did photoshop sorry my skills are not great at photoshop i did adjust this photo whatever which a would she not have a person to photoshop for her <laughs> like maybe, maybe she's maybe she's photoshopping on her own like that's cool you know work on the skills that's great but that's kind of curious um and number two i just think this kind of opens up the conversation about as ai generated content becomes more prevalent the sora uh open ai video generator they've been doing some interviews with mkbhd and joanna stern they're going to be releasing sora later this year and being able to generate that video in minutes you know, like do a prompt makes video i think i, I don't i think it's interesting that everyone's eyes are going to be looking for stuff i think ai which is i guess good but i don't know might be harder and harder to 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 recognize it and i don't know i just think it's going to be an interesting time as we head into the next couple of years with all this ai generated stuff what did you think about this uh, everything about, about this about? story is weird like i don't even know it's what weird. to think about any of it because i, I saw a take which i this is i think the one i agree with the problem with this photo isn't that she photoshopped things necessarily because we, we briefly were talking about this before we started recording i don't know what that means I, obviously there's some weird stuff happening does that mean that they took like four photos and she sort of tried to piece together the ones Composite, that were the, yeah. like and if that's the case like that's fine that's i mean get a pixel it'll do it for you without even having to think about it like <laughs> come on but best take. Uh, yeah exactly take. so like do that instead but the take that I heard that I agree with is the problem with this photo is that what the public wanted was a proof of life photo, right? Like in a hostage situation, right. you ask for a proof of life photo to make sure that the person is still alive before you pay the money. And people wanted that. And if you got a proof of life photo that looked like it was AI generated, you probably would not send the money, right? You would not like <laughs> if you got a proof of life photo and the person's holding up a newspaper and the date on it looks like you just drew it in with a Sharpie, like people are going to be like, I don't think that this qualifies and that's really the problem with this photo i don't understand any of the politics right. of like the royal family i don't understand any of the yeah. implications of like what are surgery like none of that stuff matters there's rumors about all kinds of weird things happening yeah. but the one piece i guess that's a takeaway for our listeners is this is not the last time that this is going to happen not with the royal family but where a photo right. is going to come out people are going to start looking at it right. and all of a sudden it's like huh did that really happen and i guess that's yeah. a good thing because right now ai right. is getting much more convincing at this kind of thing but i yeah it's the whole thing's weird and i'm i'm just glad that there are internet people out there who are going to be picking apart every photo that's posted from here henceforth to eternity and letting us know whether it looks funny or not. I want that. Uh, I want people to do that. Uh, I, I don't <laughs> so. know if I agree with that, but, but it's probably a useful service to some extent. Well, with, with the rise of AI generated content, I feel like that would be a very useful skill. You know, you got cyber security, you got AI generated content security. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. I want somebody looking at yeah, it. My, my anyway. favorite thing is all people right. who point out all the things that you put wrong and stuff. Like, uh, that's my favorite. I love that. Well, yeah, that's true. Yeah, exactly. Uh, apparently, this news came out that Apple Vision Pro was used in surgery to, quote, unquote, eliminate human error. This is a 95 Mac article. This is weird on several levels. One, uh, yes, the Apple Vision Pro was in a surgery. Two, I said a, two, I don't know, one, two, two. It wasn't the surgeon wearing the Apple Vision Pro. It was one of the, like, aids that hands equipment to the surgeon. I think that's an important detail. It wasn't the person actually like doing the surgery. And it was the Apple Vision Pro was basically like identifying tools and making sure that the tool the aid was picking up was act was the right tool. I'm not like there's no screenshots of what it looked like or screen grabs of like how you know, it was it's all just kind of like text. They're telling it like recalling what had happened. So okay, that's interesting. But yeah, I don't know. That's that you still don't have an Apple Vision Pro, right? Nope. This I is, still don't have an Apple yeah, Vision yeah, Pro. Yeah. And I'm I'm okay, I'm okay with that. 
I mean, unless somebody wants to send me one, and I'm okay with that too. Yeah, but yeah. I will say, I that if know. you ever get you know yeah. ready for surgery and the surgeon is wearing an Apple Vision Pro, you should get up off the table and you should leave. Even if you're under anesthesia, I'm just saying, like you should bail <laughs> immediately. <laughs> I don't care. Just take that hospital gown and it. run because you do not want your surgeon wearing a Vision Pro. Can you imagine? I mean, if the thing just failed in the middle of your surgery it's like Dies. okay we're gonna cut this uh you know we're gonna heart transplant we gotta we gotta cut make the cut right there wait where i can't see anything you just hear the bone yeah. <laughs> it just it goes dark yeah. <laughs> just, just yep, dark. you don't, you want, don't that. want that bad you don't stuff want that. uh amazon is gonna let sellers paste a link and ai can make the product page this kind of goes along with the ai generated or uh, altered photo of the royal family i find this interesting you know this might seem, I don't know what it seems like to people. I've used Printful to make like merch for podcasts and they do a really good job of just kind of like generating images of the product on stock uh, models basically and like creating those images for you and making it easy to use those then when you want to sell your merch and using AI to do it, I think it makes sense. You know, I imagine Amazon will keep an eye to make sure like these AI whatever generated product pages are actually representative of the product being sold. I'm sure the reviews would go down really fast if it was a difference between what you got and what you saw on the page. But I thought this was interesting. You uh, you had put this in here. What well, you think about I only have two quick takes because this is lightning round. The first one is I, I think you're super optimistic to think that Amazon is going to do any checking of anything. Have you seen like when Kara Swisher's book came out, there was immediately Fair. like 30 AI generated versions of the book that like were all available on Amazon and I mean, I'm pretty oh, wow. sure that Kara Swisher probably could get uh -huh. Andy Jesse on the phone, and they were still all on Amazon. So I'm not sure that that's the case, which leads to my second point. Mm. All of these AI tools have one goal, which is to eliminate friction, right? They are making it easier to do a thing. All of the things that it's doing right now can be done by humans and computers as, it, as we all exist today. They're just making it faster and easier. That's not always a good right. thing. I think that people who are mm. listing things for sale – on Amazon, it should not be this easy because Amazon is already a wasteland of crap. <laughs> like, come on. We do not need to make it any easier for people to list alphabet suits. That's true. You know, dongles and charging cords and just all of the things. I mean, there are already, like, it was, what, four or five weeks ago, a couple months ago when the story was, like, all of these randomly generated uh, you know, uh, products that were on there and like the way you knew it is mm -hmm. because the Verge had a huge story on this where it was like, you go into the description and in the description it would say this, you know, I'm a large language model, so I'm not able to do this. Like, wait, what? <laughs> oh, right. I, I, I don't think that. we need to be making it any easier. If you are selling something on Amazon, you can take the time to upload the photos and to write the description. Like, I don't, I don't know. I'm not saying it's this fair. is end of the world kind of thing. I'm just saying we don't always need to eliminate all the friction because sometimes bad things happen. <laughs> That's that's a good point. I would not want to have been in an era where Craigslist oh allowed gosh. an AI generated listing. I'm just hopeful that enough. the large language models did not ingest Craigslist as one of their sources of content. <laughs> I do, I do not want that. All right, I want to get to a personal tech, which is EVs and whether yeah. or not we pre-ordered a Rivian R2. But real quick, the Oscars were last week on Sunday. Oppenheimer took home Best Picture. Robert Downey Jr. got his first Oscar. Ever yeah. for a supporting actor, Robin Heimer. I thought that was pretty fun. Uh, but here's Steven Spielberg taking a picture. Okay, wait a minute. First of all, what is it with In and Out and famous people? I've seen pictures of Paul Giamatti eating at a at a In and Out after an award show. Steven Spielberg is now taking pictures of his In and Out burger in like a tux. What is it? Just oh. just because it's In and Out in California. Well, have you ever had An and Out burger? I have. Okay. So I mean, yeah. it's it, it's like a, it has a cult following. I don't know why Steven Spielberg, yeah. who is one of the most acclaimed directors and is a billionaire, <laughs> thinks he needs to take a photo of it. Like I don't really understand that. I go to In and Out Burger and I get really excited if I go to California, but I don't take photos anymore. Like it's not this guy can literally have it for every meal every single day. Like he could own, he could just buy In and Out probably, but I don't. So I don't know why. But that wasn't the point of this. The point was I think the case. I know. But yeah, I don't. I the, can't the help case you. The is a fun. Yeah. <laughs> Do you wait? So would you would you put? Have you had uh, Five Guys? Oh yeah, we have Five Guys around here. Yep. What would you put in and out or Five Guys? Ooh, so probably just because. Well, not just because, but I would probably go for In and Out mostly because there's a Five Guys a couple miles from our house, so I could get that anytime. So it doesn't feel quite as no. But objectively, objectively, mm. if you you can only either have Five Guys or In and Out. If you ever go out for a burger, 
for the rest of your life, which would you choose? I would probably pick In and Out. But really, but I like, like Five Guys Fries better. So can I go to both? They're better. Like, can I go to both? They're better. Yeah. No, well, I mean, I don't know. I, I just I'm gonna say I would go with Five Guys. Mm. I, I find In and Out burgers to be overhyped. That's just listen me. though. <laughs> Exhibit A. <laughs> well, they are pretty hyped up in this photo of Steven Spielberg taking a picture of them. But that picture is gonna win an Oscar. But I the, the problem with Five Guys is that you can get a cheeseburger and a Coke and it costs you thirty five dollars. It is expensive, so Un- unnecessarily so, I think. Yeah. Anyway, so this is Steven Spielberg, acclaimed director, <laughs> taking a picture of his five or his In and Out Burger, excuse me, with his iPhone, assumingly fifteen Pro, with a fine woven case, and this case looks nasty. Yeah. <laughs> this case looks rough. It looks like I it mean, it looks like he used it to make the cheeseburger on. Like he <laughs> set it down as like a as like a cutting board, and he just assembled the cheeseburger on top of it. I don't know how, like, I I do think that there's probably a through line of people like who buy all the new iPhone, like famous people, celebrities, like they're just going to buy the Apple product. Like they're not going on Amazon to buy a third party case. They're not going to Nomad. Like they're just going to buy all Apple down the line. They're going to buy the Apple phone and the Apple case. And so the choice for the, for people who do that now, it's either silicone or fine woven. I don't... I, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't see Steven Spielberg using a silicone iPhone case. I like the silicone cases. I think they're great cases. I just think Steven Spielberg, he wants something. He wants the premium case. He's Steven Spielberg. Yeah. He can do that. And uh, so he would go find Woven. And after, I don't know, what, seven months of use? <laughs> five, six months of use? It, it just looks pretty rough. Yeah. So. I, yeah, I don't. Yeah. My fine Woven case do looks think- great, but that's because I haven't used it in six months, so. Let's make a prediction, Jason. iPhone 16 event, okay? Mm. Is Apple going to release Fine Woven V2 and talk about how it's way more durable and better? Or I know they're not going to go back to uh, bovine leather because they have this whole sustainability thing. They could just go vegan leather. Yeah. Like a vegan leather option. Yeah, the problem, Cactus the problem, is, I've, the I've, problem is vegan I've, leather is plastic, yeah. right? Like most vegan leather is plastic. Oh. So that's, I think. What about cactus leather? I don't know what that is. Sounds painful. Because <laughs> actually, I do not, I I do not want an iPhone on. case with cactus on it. I'm sorry, but you can't fit that in your pocket. There's no, no way. No, listen. <laughs> this is the worst <laughs> idea ever. It hurts ever. a lot. You got to be sold out. Um, I have in uh, Ondar, the white or Blanc Aspen case is white cactus leather. And I really like the case. It's It's a nice case. It feels leather-like. It doesn't feel exactly like leather or smell like leather because it's cactus leather, but it's high quality. Like, and I use the case a lot. I like it. They could do that. Uh, maybe, but well, it, I feel like all those, every word you just said, you just made up. I don't even know what any of them meant. I, I'm, <laughs> it's just like, my word. but to answer your question, what do you think? I think that what they will do is come up with a new version of fine woven. I do not think that that's what they should do, but that is what Apple will probably do because they've already, they were already working on the second version and be, you know, before they released the first version and maybe they'll incorporate some changes. My, the problem with fine woven is it's fabric. It's, it's fabric. Like it's fabric. you do not want a yeah. fabric case. It's, you know, I have a nice pair of headphones right here and they have like a fabric-y material, but you know what? They don't, I don't spill things on that. I don't set it, you know, I don't like, <laughs> it doesn't come in counter. It's got to be a messy, yeah. yeah, if you're getting stuff on your headphones, that, that's a messy uh, eating situation. If that's situation. the case, if I'm getting something on my headphones, it's because like somebody tried to stick gum in my, I don't understand. Like there's no, yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't think fabric belongs on a phone case. I just don't. Look at this case, Jason. Yeah. Cactus leather, white. On our, and it's a nice case. Yeah. I'm just saying. It, that looks great. I it's don't know nice what case. cactus leather is, but it looks really good. It's just, is it made out of cactuses? I don't know. Is, is this just a phrase uh, they made up so that they can like, like that's a good it's question. a marketing term, but that's fine. It looks great. I mean, yes, buy that one. Yeah, I mean, great. I will highly recommend that to anyone who doesn't want fine woven. There are a billion <laughs> cases. Like I also yeah. personally, I, I mean, I have a nomad Harween leather case. It's wonderful. I don't yeah. like leather is actually nice. I understand that makes me a, an enemy of the earth. I don't buy that many leather things. I don't have leather pants. I don't do like none of that stuff. I just, <laughs> leather I just, pants. I'm just saying it's like, it is, there's reason that it's being used for so many products. It's very durable. It lasts a long yeah. time and it looks better the more that it ages. Unlike Steven Spielberg's mayonnaise smeared fine woven case. 
I'm going to put self-servingly uh, my video where I review all, like pretty much the top leather cases. It's part of the video. John Gruber actually linked to one of my leather case reviews. Oh, you got videos. fireballed. Speaking of Gruber. There so, you go. Like a fireball. There you go. So maybe you didn't do well. But anyway, I'll link to this video. There's a lot of great leather cases out there from third parties. You can you can get the, the bovine leather yeah. if you want. All right. So I'll put that great. I'll put that out there. All right, real quick, personal tech. Yeah. The Rivian had an event. Yeah. And uh the R two, the R three, and the R three X, which look like very cool cars. They look very cool. I've seen I see a couple Rivians around uh New Tampa where I am. <laughs> and a lot of hype. I watched MKBHD's video on it and you were like, how have you not reserved one of these yet? Yeah, you were talking about something, something about replacing your hamster mobile. And I thought, <laughs> if you don't have a deposit on an R2 already, I don't know what's wrong with you. So, and, and honestly, watching yeah. this event, the thing that just pained me the most is that's the company Apple should have bought, right? Remember the photo mm. you and I looked at last week of what the Apple car was supposed to look like? <laughs> And it was yes. ridi- it was like a tic tac with wheels. It was ridiculous. It was weird. This is what Apple weird. should have have been making. And really, the R three and the R three X are just they're fantastic. But the this I mean this car is for Rivian. The reason it's important is it's like starts at forty five thousand dollars instead of seventy five thousand dollars. So I think they've right. tapped out the market of people who are willing to spend close to a hundred thousand dollars on a vehicle. Because once you do some of the upgrades, it's it, these are these are not cheap cars. The R2 starts at $45,000. They're not going to deliver them until, what does it say, 2026 or whatever? 2026. So you have to wait a little while. But, like, you know, if you can keep that hamster mobile running a little bit longer. I mean, (laughs) I introduced my my nine-year-old to Flintstones yesterday because for some reason he – had heard about it and wanted to know. And he's the, his most fascinating part yeah. was the way they drive the cars with their feet, you know, going underneath of <laughs> the them. Feet. So, I mean, if you can Not keep the, the hamster mobile going a little bit longer, Flintstone style, yeah. this is, this is absolutely the vehicle that, that people, it should, people should buy. They're going to sell, especially the R3, which won't come out until after yeah. they've started delivering these. They're going to sell as many of those as they can make. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the R3, again, I watched MKBG's video on it. The R3 is like, Close to like kind of a hatchback style, yeah, it's a smaller. Yep. Yeah, it's a crossover. Might I imagine it'll be even cheaper than the R two, so it might come down to like forty, thirty five, maybe even. But I did do the thing. The hundred dollar reservation fee is refundable, so yep. you can't just reserve one of these for a hundred bucks. The hundred dollars is refundable in two years or whatever if you decide yep. not to get it. Two years is a long time, and I was like, all right, I'll do it. So I, as soon as you take to be that. I reserve. Oh, mine. I'm so happy. So I have an R2 reserve. Yeah, <laughs> so I have an happy. R2 reserve. You were, and you're officially like a amazing YouTuber cars. now. You're officially a tech YouTuber. You have a deposit on a Rivian. <laughs> so I was like, I was on social media and I was like, well, I would love to work with an EV brand <laughs> today. I'll review whatever car you want. I'll take that Fisk yeah. car that MKBHD is the worst car he's ever reviewed. I'll try that. Um, I think, tell me if this is a good idea, Jason. I think this would be funny. And if listeners are still listening at this point in the episode, <laughs> you can get a sneak peek. I thought about doing like, a car review video of my 2011 Kia Soul uh, in the style of MKBHD, uh, <laughs> like just reviewing the hamster mobile and the 212,000 miles that I put on it. Would that be funny? Like in a funny yeah, way. Do I think it's a good idea? No. Do I think you should do it? Absolutely. Cause it would be hilarious. <laughs> I think it would be so good. I'm going to do it in the, do it in the, I'm gonna do, it. do it in the uh, style of Doug DeMiro and do like the quirks and features of a, of a 12 year old car. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh, I, yeah. yeah, I think I'm going to do it. I think it would be funny. Listeners, let me know if, you, if I should do it. I think I will. Uh, this looks like an amazing car. Of course, I want it. No CarPlay, which everyone argues about. But I don't. I mean, you drive a car that doesn't have CarPlay. Do you Do you miss it? No. Um, it's it's fine because I don't – like Tesla, their software's fine. It's good. Like I don't love that they change yeah. things on me occasionally and you lose – like you have to re-put buttons in places again. But – I have a Tesla right, right. that actually has physical controls because mine's a little older, so I don't have to use the screen for as many things. Tesla's uh, right. software interface is, is great. It's better than any other car manufacturers. It's not better than CarPlay necessarily, but it is like fine. I don't miss right. having CarPlay in that car. In the Rivian is the right. same thing. Rivian, the, there's literally only two companies that know how to make software for cars: Rivian and Tesla. <laughs> like seriously, like it's true. <laughs> Everybody else, garbage. Yeah. Look at this tent too. Yep. This tent that goes on top of the R2 that looks very cool. Yeah. That looks very cool. Yeah. I'll give you that. Anyway, uh, there was that uh, unfortunate story of, of a woman who passed away in the Tesla because it, it fell in the water yep. and she couldn't get the door open, which, you know, people probably unhelpfully are like, 
there's a manual way to open the door. This is why you need to read the manual. And it's like, yeah, okay, well. It's, well, the problem you know. is that she accidentally put the car into reverse instead of forward. And this, and she apparently had told people that yeah. this has happened to her many times. And I don't know which version she was driving, right. but there are several where it's like, it's like a swiping motion with your hand on a, either on the screen or like a right. motion sensor as opposed to like, I have a physical stalk that I can adjust where I'm going. So like it right. is, the, there's a reason that cars have certain controls and taking them away doesn't make them better. I, I The last thing I wanted to say about the R2 is the reason I think that this car is going to be amazing is I think that the best in the R3 as well, the best crossover electric that was made right now is the Polestar, like the Polestar version three. I think it's, an yeah. amazing car, but it's $79,000. So just compare that. <laughs> to yeah. being able to buy like the R3 if it comes in at like $37,000 or something like that or the R2 which is a little bit bigger than the Pulsar 3 but just when you compare those things and, and I've driven actually the, the fun thing is uh, when you if you go to San Francisco and you rent a car from Hertz it's probably going to be a Polestar they have about a hundred like every Polestar really? that's ever been sold I think is on the Hertz lot in San, at San Francisco's airport and they're really they're great to drive <laughs> wow. they're then they have air, they have CarPlay so like that that's amazing, but uh-huh. the nice thing about it is, if you get the um, the Rivian, you can save yourself about forty thousand dollars. So there you go. See, there's also I feel like this is maybe what Craig Federighi drives the Lucid Air. <laughs> yes. Um, which so this this is the Lucid Air starts at seventy one seventy four thousand uh, dollars. The sunroof on these look wild. But then this is the the Polestar. Yes, Polestar three also starts at seventy. Yeah, and Polestar does make but... a sedan. There's the Polestar one and the Polestar two. Uh, one is fully electric. One is a hybrid. Um, the Polestar one, okay. I think it is, is actually really rare. It's really hard to find them. They, it was actually a hybrid vehicle. The Polestar two is a sedan. The Lucid. I was at Lucid's launch event, and this is. I was actually surprised oh. to see that there you can get one now for seventy five thousand. Because when I when I was at the launch event for <laughs> Lucid, the the lowest priced model was one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And Sheesh. so they have come down and, and people like the lucid, their advantage is they charge really quickly and they have very, very long range. They make, they have the best battery technology basically of any of the electric vehicles. And they were their, their yeah. CEO was the person who designed the model S and it's like, he left and he's like, we're going to just do all the things better that Tesla didn't do with the vehicle. Wow. And so like they, they have some real chops. They just haven't been able to sell enough of them maybe because they were $150,000 to, to like be sustainable, <laughs> right. but lucid absolutely. Like if they can, if they can start turning these things out in volume, they're making a great vehicle. They have an SUV. It's kind of ridiculous because I think it is like $200,000 or something like that, or they're working on one. But anyway, I, I just, yeah, the lucids are great. All of them are yeah. great. But the thing that's great is now you can buy a very good electric vehicle for less than $50,000, which is the thing that, that, yeah. that Rivian had to do if they were going to, to, to make it basically. Right. I'm I'm excited for Rivian. I'm excited to maybe I'll get one in two years. I'm excited for them to sponsor the show and give us some demo cars. Listen, I've really tried to. I couldn't even. Yeah, I'm not going to get into it. But this is uh, <laughs> one thing people noticed, and this was a thing that was going around. People were noticing that in a lot of the photos. So the Rivians charge in the front. They're the R1 S and the R1T. Right. But the R2 and the R3 have their charging port in the back, and people are like, "Well, that's really weird." The reason why is they have NACS ports on them, which is the Tesla charger port right. and the Tesla superchargers right. you you back in, right? So that so they are standardizing right. this. I'm assuming that most of the electric vehicles we start to see going forward are going to have the ports moved to the back so that you can back into a yeah. supercharger until you can park it. But that's great because that means that the R2 is going to have the NACS charger charging standard built in. You won't need an adapter. You'll be able to go to right. any supercharger in America and use it in, in charge this vehicle yeah. um, without having to worry about compatibility. So that's really cool. Well, I reserve mine two I'm, years from I'm now. So we'll, excited. We'll, we'll review it. We'll I promise you, you'll use right. it more often than the Apple vision pro. Listen, I have not used it in over a week. <laughs> I'll be honest. <laughs> Okay, so next I have, next week, here's the thing. Next week, we have to do a semi-long-term review of the Vision Pro and a semi-long-term v- oh, review good. of the MacBook Air that I've been carrying around with me, the M3. Oh, that's good. So, All right, that's good. I'll, I'll, I'll have to make a note that, about that right. in a second. Okay, so anyway, we're going to go to bonus stuff. So Jason went to South by Southwest. He interviewed Delta CEO, so I want to hear about his experience down. If you want it down in uh, Austin, Texas, yep. so if you want to hear that bonus episode, again, Support the show, Apple Podcast. Go to primarytech.fm. You can support us through Memberful there. Get access to all the, you get all the back catalog of bonus episodes. We have a great one on physical media. 
Uh, we, have, we talk about, I forgot what else. Do we have a great bonus episodes? I forget all we talked about. But anyway, they're all there. They're all, you can listen to all, all of them. Good. <laughs> they're all good. We can't all pick the great our favorite shows. child. Come on. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So you should check that out. We're going to go record now. Again, five star rating and review in Apple Podcasts. If you haven't, subscribe to youtube.com slash at primary tech show. All those links are in the show notes. Thanks again for listening and watching. We'll catch you next week.